Okay, um, everybody, kia ora, and welcome to the first uh, workshop and briefing for 2023. Um, obviously, we're going to have to um, put the start time as 10 to 12, um, so that uh, people will be here by 12 o'clock. Um, we've got another very full day uh, ahead of us, um, including little bus ride later on in the afternoon, but for the first part of the day, we're going to talk about some of our long-term plan um, amendments uh, around the rates and uh, financial review. Uh, this is a public workshop, as you know, so it is being live streamed. Uh, we have Sam uh, on Zoom. Can you hear us okay, Sam? I can, thank you. Good afternoon. Cool. Um, we have apologies from Ross uh, Brennigan. Uh, but I've not heard of uh, from anyone else so uh, at the stage. But let's uh, kick into it. So thank you, Jacinda. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you and welcome, everyone. So the purpose of today is to first give everybody a snapshot of some of the direction that we were provided with um, at the end of last year, and then we'll provide some more information um, in terms of the impacts of borrowings based on the on the capital program, particularly in relation to Three Waters um, that we talked about last year, and its impacts on borrowings and rates. Well, based on the conversations that we've had prior to Christmas as well around rates, we'll give it an update on uh, where the direction was that was landed um, before the end of the year last year to get us to the 7.9%. And also, in terms of the rates review, we'll provide you with some more um, information and discussion and analysis in terms of where we're proposed to head in terms of the rates review at this stage. Just to highlight as well that there will be more detail in terms of the rates review as part of the session next week. Um, and at that stage, you would expect to see very detailed analysis provided on all the different options. There'll be some that will be provided today, but it won't be as in-depth as it will be. Um, this time next week. So I'll pass over to Daniel first. He's going to talk you through the three waters and the decisions, an overview of the decisions that were made last year. And then I'll jump in and we'll start talking about um, the, the borrowings and the rates impacts of that. Just to highlight that the presentation is available in your portal. As well in your portal, there is a 20 year capital program summary, which gives you all based on the discussions and the, of, of the capital program that's being proposed, um, that lists that program each year at an activity by, by project level. So it's not something that you need at this early at this stage, but we thought it was better that we give you the information now so you've got more time to digest it and ask questions. So I'll pass over to Daniel. Welcome back. The uh, Three Waters... We've got about four slides, basically same slides as last year, so we'll just use it as an opportunity for a quick refresh. Um, happy to take any questions throughout. But what has changed is some further thinking around our borrowing, so actually scaling back um, even under option one, which has been modelled for the LTP, um, to deliver the current LTP projects, allowing for that escalation, is that we are still looking to limit borrowings in a similar manner to what we've done this year with a, with a higher... Um, projected 45 million and then cutting it back to the, the 35 year limit, um, a similar process that we're looking at for the remainder of the LTP. So Jacinda will talk to that, um, but really just a quick refresh and any, any questions of, around where we landed last year. Uh, regardless of whether a form lands, there was a clear message that significant investment is required in Three Waters infrastructure, and it's important that we signal that to our community. A lot of the projects are currently in the LTP, and they were pushed out through that LTP proper process into some of the later years. Um, so we're really going back through that process again to really look at what uh, what's important and how we prioritise our investment. Uh, key highlight around Levin with the Pods Road Water Supply Reservoir, Levin Wastewater Treatment Plant, significant upgrade there, and we'll, we'll see that on our site visit, and also the Levin Water Treatment Plant. Um, so this option that's been modelled for LTP is effectively $70 million over, overall across that 20-year uh, LTP life cycle. Uh, the, a lot, some of that's made up around the certainty. So we talked last year about the fact that a lot of these projects are very early in their life cycle, that they're concepts, and as we get a lot more certainty around 
the details. We, over time, um, generally see some of the cost certainty, but also cost increases. So a lot of the updates that we've done for this process um, and also for the Three Waters transition team, so we've got until March this year to really lock in what those budgets are that will be modelled at a national level for the, for their work. But we've, we've taken that in isolation for our council activity to, to scale that back um, even further than where the, where the Three Waters transition budgets landed. So that's a summary of that capital spending over the over the period 24 to 33. Jacinta will talk about that in more detail as to how we've interpreted that. But really, you know, just signalling that there's a difference between what was in the LTP two years ago to what we're signalling in the financial model um, this year with that $70 million increase. So putting aside that three orders reform and the final capex for this year, um, the key details around option one is that it requires an additional $70 million early in the life cycle of the LTP. So that's that's bringing forward the investment in the wastewater treatment plants and the water treatment plants into the next decade, rather than deferring those out um, and, and hoping for the best. It's a, it's a matter of saying, let's start planning now. And there's always an opportunity to um, to, to push those projects uh, to meet the demand, but certainly need to get a signal to get that investment locked in and get the planning underway. So there still are quite low end estimates and they will remain so until there's more certainty around some of those larger projects, the likes of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this option does, however, include an additional $12 million of stormwater improvements over and above what was in the original LTP. So that's a clear message to the community that through the winter that we've experienced that we are looking to actually invest more in that stormwater space. Uh, the live-in wastewater and water treatment plant upgrades it uh, does also, this option still includes, and, and along with the, the option two, the prospect of water metering. So that was a conversation with our community around the importance of understanding where our leaks are within the private network. And the, you know, over the last three or four years, Council's done a lot of work to improve its existing network and understand the, the leaks and, and remedy those within the road reserve. But when we get to the private property, uh, the, the clear option to address the leaks on private property is to actually understand where they are and that's that's the um the opportunity that water metering provides so it's important that we have a conversation with our community around that and also moving forward with the investment around the pose road water supply reservoir which there's seen some cost increases as was gone through a process uh, almost to consenting so we're very close to lodging a consent um, in the early part of this year but that's certainly um, allowed us to get more certainty around some of the costs that we can expect to incur in that space. The option two, which wasn't the one that we've modelled and won't be the one that Jacinda talks about, was the prospect of trying to meet the budget to say, well, costs have increased significantly post-COVID, um, fuel price impacts, labour costs, uh, a lot of certainty around those projects. If we are to still deliver to that same budget that was in the original LTP, some things have to change and we need to be upfront with ourselves that we can't afford to do everything in that space. And so option two was really looking at no additional investment in that three waters capex, uh, short term reduction, um, doesn't keep pace with escalation, it's a slowdown in the water investment. So that's you know the fact around having a resilient water supply, um, the impacts around that, uh, deferring renewals where possible Scaling back on those stormwater improvements uh, still include the district wide water metering, but it was also considering the further deferral of the likes of Waitiriri and all our water and wastewater projects. So, you know, look, looking at saying, well, if we need to push back on our additional investment around the, you know, our key trunk infrastructure, the water supply in Levin and the wastewater supply, then we also need to scale back on expanding that network further. So, looking at deferral in that space. So that was that was the, the crux of option two. So what does this mean for consultation? Uh, we were pretty clear early on in December that we couldn't afford to deliver to the scale and extent that the Three Waters transition had requested of us. So that was, that was looking at all of that investment to be fully compliant um, and, and have a higher level of resilience. It was the you know the, the blue sky is thinking around what would we do if we if, if budget wasn't the limit, um, and so that that's still the line that's being taken with Three Waters Transition that they want to plan for that, and they'll have their own work to do 
at a national scale when they start to look at affordability across the um, across the country. But we were quite clear early on in the process that this council couldn't stretch to that, and we we haven't put that forward in the financial model. And so what we've landed on is option one and two, having that overall investment somewhere in the region of 215 to 275 million over the next 20 years. Uh, in the context, the Three Waters NTU budget was around 342 million dollars. So that's a significant difference, you know, an order of another 70 million dollars over and above what we're planning under under option one. The both options include an upgrade at the Levin wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we're sending a message that we can't keep deferring that work. The plant was built in the 1950s. Uh, with the growth that's occurring, with the challenges we're facing in the maintenance and operations of that site, um, we need to start planning now for the future. It's it's not a, a, a click of the fingers um, proposal that we can turn on quite quickly when we find the need for it. So it's, it's something that we need to signal the investment and, and start planning. Uh, it's still, they still both include improved resilience for living drinking water supply, uh, but certainly under option two, we'd start to be looking at timing for that. So whether we needed to actually start deferring some of that investment or, or smoothing some of that. Um, but both options still look at improved resilience for water supply and also the installation of water meters. Um, that was in, in order to defer the plant upgrade, um, we could push that out into the, the late 2020s. Uh, in terms of a, a significant upgrade to the plant, looking at a little bit more storage if we could find out where all the, the leaks in our network are. The key differences are the funding, obviously, the $70 million, um, the drawback and in investment around the stormwater, so really status quo, which is less than a million dollars a year that's spent in that uh, stormwater improvement space, and then the deferral of the Waitiriri or how water and wastewater project. So that that in effect framed the um, the topics for consultation for the LTP. Any questions before we move on to what does that mean for budgets and modelling? Thanks, Daniel. So in terms of the wider budgets and the conversation we've just had around the capital program and the additional $70 million increase from the long-term plan. If you look at the, the graph that's on the, on the wall there, those gray bars that you see are effectively that capital program. <laughs> so when you open up your detailed capital um, spreadsheet in your portal, you'll see a, a detailed listing of those projects that equals to those, to those totals. In terms of the conversation about borrowings, and I'll show it to you in a minute, from an NTU perspective and from a from a negotiating perspective with the Crown, we needed to be clear about what projects we ideally need to have delivered in particular years to put our best foot forward in terms of negotiating with the Crown in terms of what this district needs. However, from a prudent perspective and in terms of our borrowings and our ability to deliver a capital program of 70 million would be significantly challenged. Um, typically, we've delivered between 30, the, the high 20s and, the, and mid 30s in terms of a, what's reasonable for us for a capital program. And that's a key reason why for this year, when we set our borrowings um, numbers, we, we set a program of 47, which has become 50 million in terms of a possible capital program, which has given us the flexibility to start some projects and move some projects, um, depending on when what happens um, in terms of the economy and our ability to deliver in certain contracts. So what we've done and what you'll see in, in the next slide in terms of the borrowings is that we've assumed while we've, in terms of the long-term plan, you'll see a detailed program of potential projects up to the level of the gray bars. From a reasonableness perspective, we've limited that capital program delivery in terms of a borrowings need to no more than just uh, just over $50 million in the first few years. It's just unrealistic to assume that we could complete um, the full 70. So what does that, that gray line, oh, sorry, the green line just gives you an indication of what that looked like in terms of the long-term plan program. Now, if you look at what this means from a borrowings perspective, if you look at the light green bars, they are what, um, the full program 
would mean in terms of a borrowings for the first 10 years. Um, if you look at the light blue, that's what it looked like in the long-term plan. So we were squeaking up close to the 225% limit, which is the orange line um, in year 2025, but then um, had some comfortable room. Because that program in terms of the water has grown by that 70 million, that has caused us some pressure around, um, around the borrowing line. If you assume the level of capital that we, we've, we have in terms of delivering at this level, so no more than just over 50, that would mean that our borrowings would sit where that dark green line is now. So by 2027, um, we are very close to a 250% limit. So part of the conversation we need to have today is knowing that we're leading into three waters reform, is it reasonable to increase the limit of our debt in the first 10 years, assuming that waters carries on, um, but what I'll mention as well in terms of that conversation is if you look at our borrowings picture excluding water, so assuming on 1 July 24, three our three waters transitions off our this council's balance sheet, we're due to have negotiations with the Crown around our borrowings um, in early March. This is what our borrowings profile would look like. So we're comfortable in terms of headroom and capacity in our borrowings, excluding water, the keep and keeping well within the 225 limit. But in terms of the picture with water, because of that significant investment that's needed, it's worth the table considering an option to increase just for the water for the water portion of the debt um, for the short term. So that's a conversation um, that I wanted to introduce today uh, that we can have um, some more discussions on today and then have some further conversations on next week. Before I do that, does anyone have any points or questions they wanted to raise? Um, just one, I suppose just because if we lose three waters debt, does that that doesn't necessarily mean that our limit sits at 225 percent of what our because those figures will change, won't they? So that may not necessarily automatically relate as easily as that. I, you know, if we're taking all that three waters debt out, surely our capacity to to borrow, while it might be greater, we would the limit would come down. Or you know, it would change at that high level. It doesn't to me. It doesn't seem logical that we wouldn't have to make some alteration if three water steps not there. It does, although this picture gives you the view of it with that water revenue taken out. So that's just the ex excluding the waters picture. So yes, that the the income reduces for the waters, but the, but our debt significantly reduces. So I think what Mayor Bernie's question is he's just wanting to seek clarity on the proportionality that the rate decrease, the debt limit decreases proportionate to our income. Um, and so that demonstrates that. Yeah, proportionate to the income, but also we won't have those assets anymore, so we don't have that value. Yeah, so is that therefore, um, and, and that graph is showing that impact as well okay what we do need to be careful of as well though um and that's why we need to show it is what if the government change what if things change yeah what if um three waters doesn't go ahead and this council continues to have the requirement of three waters debt um and that perspective is we need to still make prudent decisions assuming that that is a real possibility as well so you wouldn't want to go and um, spend up to 300% um, no. in case in case that, that was it was going to continue to stay on our balance sheet. There's still enough uncertainty about what might happen that we need to make sure we're comfortable with both positions. There is, in terms of, if you look at this program, for example, one thing that we could bring to the table next week in terms of a conversation as well is... Um, 
possibly if we limited the, the, the spending in any given year to 45 million in terms of a borrowing assumption, what, what that might look like in terms of a borrowings picture. So that's something I'll do for next week, just so that there are different options for you to look at in terms of delivery. I suppose what I'm trying to think is if our limit is 250% at the moment, what actual value is that? Is that $180 million that we can borrow? And if we lose the three waters debt and we, our level is 250%, what level does that actually become at that stage? Does it become $100 million or does it become $80 million or what, what is the level that we, um, we need to be at? Sure, I'll bring the detail around that to the next meeting. That's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> Jacinda, what does the trend line look like beyond 2031? Um, if you go to the next slide, it's just I sort of noticed that we're, we're peaking through this 27, 28, 29, and, and then we haven't yet got a trend down. So at what stage in that 20-year forecast are we starting, assuming we continue with the spend and assuming we retain three waters, um, does that start to potentially trend, a, trend back downwards to give us a bit more breathing space? It does. It's, and it's a good question. And for, so for next week as well, I'll include the full 20-year picture. But it does effectively start to trend down from around this point. Um, so this is the peak point of, of the debt, and then it does start to trend down. And Daniel, in terms of the smoothing and the time delivery of some of those significant projects, is there anything now that you can point to that would shift the style and get us a li little bit more breathing space in, in that 27, 28 year period? Yeah, without backing too far away from where we landed, with the message to three waters is that this work does need to be done. And we had this conversation in you know, two years ago with the LTP proper, and we'll be back here again in 12 months' time or not, depending on what happens with three waters transition, to really scrutinise that in you know, quite a significant amount of detail across that wider programme. What, what we've effectively done is updated the LTP 2141 with our best estimate of current figures and new information. So some of those projects have increased in costs, but we have got three quite big ticket items, or certainly um, with that wastewater plant that sits in that window, and it's it really does come, start to come down to that um, our appetite for us to keep deferring those significant projects, and it's probably something that um, requires a more in-depth paper to be brought back to council to to help inform some of those decisions. And what we're signalling with the borrowings is that that would provide us some flexibility if we were to cap that borrowing of 45 for us to do some prioritisation over the next um, 12 to 18 months in that space. You know, as those projects further develop, um, you might find that one starts to get ahead of the other. So there's, there'll, there'll always be an opportunity to do that. Um, you know, and that would be a decision of council as to you know, the exact timing of investment once we have more certainty around it. So just highlighting there, that conversation was around what's a reasonable financial strategy limit, um, including waters at this stage, given the increased investment that's needed. Again, just the, in terms of the next week conversation, um, I'll bring back that profile for the 20 year period, um, show the limits both in terms of dollars and percentages, both before and after water. Um, and then also show a picture of what the borrowings would look like, assuming we capped it at 45 million so that you've got all, all of those pictures to look at. Jacinta, um, it's Sam here. Can I just ask a question on that previous slide? Sure, go ahead. Can I just clarify? Yeah, so my understanding is that from 2025 onwards, our LGFA limit reduces to 280% of income. So that gives us, so that on that basis, in terms of that first bullet, that would give us essentially a 30% headroom. Um, and so the numbers that you're going to be bringing next week will give us a dollar figure around what does that headroom actually look like? Is that, is that am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. I can give you the picture in terms of what does the headroom look like to the LGFA limit and also to the 225 and 250 limit. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Okay, now stepping into um, the rate side of things. So prior, when we first set um, or had a conversation about how rates were looking, this was probably the first time we were more descriptive to the council table in terms of where we were at the rating process very early on um, and, and highlighting what is normally, what is quite, can be quite normal for councils in terms of significant um, two-figure increases when budgets are first looked at. Often there are a number of good ideas and proposals in there that activity managers put forward. Um, so in November, an initial budget was put forward of 21%. And then in November, um, that was reduced down to 18.9%. That 18.9%, I'll talk through again today, but that was described um, in a, number of a couple of workshops with the council and the key reasons for that increase. What was unusual about this budget with um, double figure rates increases was there wasn't really anything exciting and new in that budget. It was um, a, a significant budget increase to deliver on significant cost increases that the council was incurring. So I'll talk through what they were. Um, as this table worked through those rates increases and what could be done about them and different options um, for bringing that number down. Um, there was a great process, I thought, in terms of you all having a look at options, both in terms of service level increases, looking at different options for funding, um, for different, op uh, different um, parts of various increases. Um, and good views were put forward to get to a relatively good consensus in terms of a, um, a point to start to prepare. A consultation document based on that could be approved by this council table um, to go out for consultation. So while there wasn't any decision making made prior to Christmas in those public workshops, it was um, at least getting us down to a level of a rates increase where we would be comfortable um, to start preparing a consultation document based on and also to start getting it ready for the audit, the auditors when they arrive. So what I'll do briefly is highlight um, just talk through briefly again the 18.9% increase just to make sure that it's clear um, as well for members of the public that may be listening today as well. Um, so that 18.9% was an overall total dollar rates increase. Remembering that 1.9% um, is assumed in terms of a level of growth um, for the number of households that are expected to come on board in this district. Um, we have been tracking along well over the last couple of years in terms of the growth that we're expecting and hopefully we will get there this year, although this would be the year that we would be challenged a bit more potentially in terms of, of that rates increase. So if, for example, we get to close to consultation finishes, we get close to striking the rates and that number actually looks more like 1.7%, then the average rates increase that the, the household would experience would be slightly higher than that. But we will track, we always track that number very closely um, as we work through the consultation period. So in terms of what was driving that rates increase, 8.2% of it, um, which is a, a significant amount, um, was driven by insurance, depreciation, utilities and interest costs. So very core costs that the council doesn't have a choice about in terms of what it needs to pay. Um, in saying that, that would be unless we went to some measures in terms of the level of insurance we hold in and those types of measures. Almost half of that, or just over half of that, pardon me, was driven by the Three Waters area. In terms of the rest of the increase, we had um, a significant increase in rates as well in the 570,000 roughly was due to the fact that in the regulatory space, um, we are seeing volumes decrease. So the level of fees and charges that are expected in that area is expected to decline. Um, and you'll see that when you look at our organization performance report that will come out um, today or tomorrow in terms of the level of revenue is dropping um, as we're expecting it to. In terms of governance and partnerships, um, this is funding that we uh, are providing to 
um, iwi to assist with um, council with um, processes and um, developing the district and operating the district. This is not an increase in terms of, of the value that we have contributed in the past, but it is an increase in terms of it being funded from rates rather than um, through the capital program. And that's to be clear that it's not always a capital program that, that that's being funded for. In terms of um, the district plan, there's a legislative requirement around delivering an e-plan, so that's $75,000. Um, just remembering, that I'll, I'll step into the next bit around the 7.9, but some conversations were made where the 7.9% actually, that includes now some of that being funded through borrowings instead. In terms of staff wage increases, there are no extra staff budgeted as part of this plan, but it is assumed that there is a 3% inflationary increase in staff wages that's included within the budget. As well in terms of other three waters increases that are not related to insurance, depreciation, interest um, is another close to 1%. As well, initially when that 18.9% budget was set, um, it was thought that a portion of staff time that usually goes to capital projects was going to be reduced as part of that 7.9%. Um, the future, the rates increase that we're comfortable with now, that's actually been reduced significantly um, based on what we think we can absolutely deliver. As well as part of the um, commitment in the financial strategy was to reduce the level of unfunded depreciation um, to be fully funding by year five. Um, so that resulted in, as part of the long-term plan, a rates increase for this year of 2.7%. And there is some conversation um, in the moving to the 7.9 7 about reducing that partially. Um, and lastly, contracted increases also make up a, a portion of that rates increase. So 7.9 seemed at the time last year to be a, a level that, that this table was comfortable moving towards a decision-making process and a consultation document. So again, nothing's changed in terms of the key drivers of the initial part of that rates increase. But the key changes come here in terms of different options that were discussed um, with this table and agreed in terms of put, to be put forward for decision making as part of the consultation process. So it was agreed that $75,000 for the e-plan would be funded by borrowings, and that's because it has a longer term benefit than just one year. Um, in terms of the three waters increases, now this was a significant point of conversation prior to Christmas. Um, it was proposed um, by this table that uh, two and a half million dollars of the three waters increases would be funded by borrowings rather than rates. Um, so that's a discussion um, that's been included in the 7.9%. As well, the conversation around the capital program um, reducing from 37 million in that first year down by 10. So that interest impact of that has been factored into that rates increase as well. Um, the initial conversation around reducing the level of unfunded depreciation by the amount that it was has been reduced so a portion of that, rather than have a 1.3% increase, that's been reduced down by 620,000. So it's about $700,000 that the rates are being increased by to slow to bring back that unfunded depreciation to hopefully get to a zero position. And lastly, or the most significant last one is around the Levin Aquatic Center business case. So. Um, this includes the assumption now that rather than funding that through rates, that it's reasonable to fund that through borrowings because it's part of that longer term capital investment um, in, in the aquatic centre. So with those changes that were discussed prior to Christmas, that gets us to a 7.9% rates increase after an average increase after growth, taking account of the growth in the rate payer base. Does anyone have any questions or points they wanted to raise on that at this stage? Jacinta, sorry, just Sam. So just confirming that in terms of the rates, 
um, does that mean that when the consultation document um, goes out that we will still be including potentially some of the other potential savings that don't make up that 7.9 but that involve so, so that people can submit on uh, specific things around further reducing that if if yeah if that's where they're if, if that's if they're minded to yes definitely so that was absolutely the will of the table at that stage was that for example, berm mowing and reducing the level of berm mowing got a, was quite a, um, a topic of conversation um, leading into last year. So that, together with different service level options, because the actually in terms of service level options, there weren't any selected as such to, to further reduce that level of rates. But absolutely, the intention is to include some in the consultation document so that members of the public have an opportunity to um, put their own ideas, but also to give their views on on, what, on on potentially reducing service levels or making other changes to reduce rates. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, great. So that steps us through. We've been through the water changes, what it means for borrowings, how our rates numbers tracking. Now what I'll do is I'll invite Vi to join us at the table and we will talk through, um, first I'll give you an overview of the compliance with the revenue financing policy and then there were two areas in particular um, that we were going to discuss in more detail um, in terms of the revenue financing policy. So welcome Vi. Just to highlight, so the revenue financing policy um, is the key policy for the council uh, to decide on and it drives the decisions about what we do, who benefits, who's causing harm or benefit to the community, who benefits from those activities, who should pay for them and what sources, are, if they are going to pay for them, how should they pay and if the council's funding source is going to pay for them, then how and with what means and how should it be shared. So. Um, it is your key document in terms of giving the ability for you to steer how the, how things are funded and also who should pay for them. So in terms of the considerations, um, I'm going to step back a little bit and just go back to the Local Government Act considerations just to make sure it's really clear as we step in um, to a few areas in a bit more detail today. So the step one, in terms of what the Act requires, um, step one requires the Council to consider the community outcomes to which each activity contributes, um, and also the distribution of benefits between the whole community or a certain part of the community. So is it a, is it a certain group that's benefiting or is it the whole community? Also the benefits over which that activity occurs, um, and particularly in the in the light for the likes of um, food waste, for solid waste, for um, different areas where there is an impact on the community, or an exacerbator or a polluter, it's also important to understand that aspect as part of assessing a, for example, trade waste. Is there an exacerbator in the sense of? that trade waste is causing impact on council's infrastructure if that can be if that can be determined and understood how much of that activity's expenditure should be paid by that group of exacerbators so that's what exacerbator is and, and is a key consideration in the process as well um, also it's important that we consider the costs and benefits of funding the activity separately step 2 in terms of the consideration is the impact on the overall community and the well-beings for that community but also it's another factor that while you may for example see that those that use the pool are the benef main beneficiaries of the aquatic center but when you consider the cost if you were to put all the costs of using the swimming pool onto the users of the swimming pool then there are a number of families and children who couldn't go to the pool um, because of from an affordability perspective. So while there is specific criteria that you need to assess, there is also 
a level of affordability and, and an assessment of people's access to services that needs to be considered as part of that process as well. So in terms of where we sit currently, there's three sets of graphs that I'll walk you through, but in general, we're tracking along well in the resource and planning area. Health licensing and dog and animal control, control are the two areas where, in terms of our revenue and financing policy, these two dots here give you an indication of when the policy was last set, and it wasn't reviewed in detail as part of the last long-term plan, it was the plan before that. This is the level of fees and charges or other funding that are expected. So across the re regulatory space, we are tracking well in those areas. And in resource consents and building consents, we've just squeaked into the green in some of them after your decisions around increasing fees and charges by that 5% in that area. So that's how we've become compliant in some of those areas. So you can see that these are the two areas that we need to talk through in more detail today. In terms of the community area, it's tracking well. The one area um, in the library and community centers, we are tracking slightly lower. At this stage, given that there has been some, a fair amount of impact in terms of COVID on volumes and different things happening with those centers, we think it's best to wait until the long-term plan for that one and just understand um, what the new normal is once things settle down a little bit in that stage before making too many changes. Also with the um, fees free or the fines free, free fines um, is understanding what impact that might have on revenue as well. So it's probably reasonable to wait a little bit in terms of that area. Lastly, in the infrastructure area and community property, um, Things are tracking well, with the exception, of course, of the fact that we no longer have fees um, in the landfill area, the solid waste area. So at this stage, this particular area will need to follow any decisions that are made around the future of the landfill rather than make any separate decisions about it as part of this process. Does anyone have any questions around that bit before we jump into a bit of detail? So health licensing, dog and animal control are the two that we're going to focus on today. So what I'll do is I'll pass over to Vi um, to talk through what's happening in the dog and animal control area. Um, and then we're also going to do a bit of a whiteboard session around who benefits and who pays um, in relation to the health area as well. Sorry, Jacinta, can I just um, jump in, uh, Sam here? Just on the, um, if you could go back one slide, to the um, uh, the refuse collection, can you just um, off the top of your head, or can you give me a ballpark figure of actually what the financial shortfall there is? Because even if depending on what the decision is around the landfill, what we're saying there is that we could be carrying a whole another year of um, where the cost of providing the service is. Uh, totally out of whack with the revenue that it's generating. So, uh, do do you have any indication of what what kind of number we're actually talking about in that in that column? Well, while Vi talks to the next bit, I'll have a quick look, um, and then we can talk Thanks. through it after that if that's okay. Thanks, Alex. Cheers. Tinakoto Katawa. Um, so looking at the dog and animal control activities, <clears throat> what we've done is gone through and done an analysis of um, the community, community outcomes, who benefits um, and who should pay for it or the rationale behind it. Um, for the dog control activity, um, you know, the Dog Control Act actually outlines that the costs associated with delivering the dog control activity should be reasonably recovered by the dog owner. Uh, for the animal control activity, so this we're talking about things like Yarra Rural District Stock, um, some of the public activities that go with that, and um, education, um, patrols, that has more of a public safety um, and a community good. And so what... Um, we've gone and done is a uh, response to the last time I, I sat around here and spoke about these activities is actually looked at the dog control activity versus the animal control activity separately 
um, historically, so not in this last LGP, but certainly in LGPs prior, um, it wasn't unusual for us to have separated out the animal control activity and the dog control activity. And what we're proposing is that we go back to that model and look to separate the dog control activity and animal control activity. Gosh, how many times can you say dog control activity and animal control activity in the sentence? Um, so this slide just um, goes through um, essentially that. Um, so where we've got uh, community outcomes in terms of strong communities and supporting the, you know, obviously, strong communities in, in our middle here, there is an element of both dog control and animal control that contribute to that. Um, and when we go through and take a look at, at what we're proposing here is that for the animal control, sorry, for the dog control activity, as I said before, the dog control that sets the um, the basis is to the cost recovery anyway, um, and so we are suggesting that we stick with the current 70 to 80 percent cost recovery. So this is the user pays, um, and for the animal control activity, what we're suggesting is you know, we don't have stock owners register their stock with us. Um, the income stream for the animal control activity is really minimal. Uh, we're talking about if we manage to impound an animal, it doesn't get collected, which is not what we want. Um, and it goes to the sale yards and gets sold. That's, that's the majority of the income that we get in the animal control space. So what we're proposing is that the animal control activity actually be uh, 95 to 100% publicly funded, um, and the dog control activity sticks with the um, you know, 20 to 30% publicly funded. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions around the dog control, animal control? Sorry, a correction on that. I'm not keeping up. Um, we're actually proposing to change the dog control one to 30 to 40, um, not, yeah, not 20 to 30, like I said before. Apologies for that. I think it would be really good to get a stare from elected members on this one. Um, what I think I heard at the end of last year from elected members is that you felt like the dog control activity should be have a higher private funding split, split. Um, so there was some language being thrown around around like the 90-10 versus the what we what's up here which is kind of the 60-40-70-30 um, so getting a steer from elected members around this would be helpful Sorry if I can just add to that as well um, when we're thinking about the costs associated with that because we're splitting it and then there's the dog control activity and the animal control activity it won't be um, as I said before sorry um, as I said the last time we were around here it won't be all of those costs associated and then distributing it out to be the, the shortfall that we're looking for it'll be in the dog control activity itself only and make myself well, look, just to kick it off, I, on this occasion, I, I do support a higher private component, um, and I think I think as elected members, we've all been made aware of where there have been issues with wandering, dangerous, menacing dogs, and those issues lie squarely with the owners. Um, I'm talking about urban areas here. I'm not necessarily talking about the rural dog situation, um, and and to me the the benefit lies very much and the responsibilities lie very much with the owners of the dogs. Um, and so I would support on this occasion a higher private benefit and a lower public benefit. Can I just play devil's advocate to that a little bit, David? Um, in terms of by doing that, what risk are we then following with people not being responsible dog owners and not registering their dogs, not looking after them properly, which means that we are actually spending more money on animal control and dog control than we've ever done in the past because they're not looking after them properly because of the cost is seen as a barrier. I just put that out there, but I, you know, that's the sort of dilemma that we've got to be able to find the right balance between making sure that they are being responsible dog owners um, and the cost of doing that. Oh, 
just just to respond to that, I mean, that's a, that's a fair challenge. Um, I guess my response to that is really important when we're considering private benefit is how easy is it to collect, you know, and we've seen instances elsewhere where we aspire to a higher level of private uh, benefit, but we just can't collect the fees. There's always the risk with dong owners that they won't register. I'd be interested in just hearing from the officers um, what sort of data we have around that, but my instinct at this stage is that there would be not significant difference in terms of the numbers who would fail to register commensurate with the actual increase in the fees, but I'd be interested to hear from Vi on that. Um, thank you, Councillor Allen. So every year, um, and one of our performance measures for the dog control activity is the number of dogs that are accounted for in the district um, by the 31st of October. And every year we manage to get more than 95% of dogs in our system registered um, and accounted for. The 5%, yes, they don't they do move through a compliance and enforcement process, which does, you know, cost in terms of time and, and effort and energy um, moving through that process. But it's you know five percent. Um, if you know, so we're talking about affordability here of our community. Um, if we're looking at putting the dog registration fees up, last time I sat around the table and talked about what that percentage might look like. It wouldn't necessarily be the same because we are separating out the dog control activity from the animal control activity as well. Just to add another voice here yeah, of the same vein as David Allen on this um, higher private and um, irresponsible owners won't pay whether it's 10%, 20 or 30. They just won't full stop. So I don't, yeah, we need to um, set it at the, um, probably on more of a 2080, but we'll see where it lands. So does that pretty much mirror the incidents that we have in terms of a percentage and 95% of our call-outs to unregistered dogs? Or what does that split between registered and unregistered dogs that incident call-outs call actually look like? Um, thank you. I haven't done the analysis to, to that extent, um, but I would say no, it doesn't. Um, there is quite a number of dogs that are registered that don't get picked up or that have some sort of animal control actions or activity that's associated with it. Um, you know, there are good dog owners who don't intend, you know, bad things happen just because they do. Um, and there are, you know, dog owners on the other end of the spectrum who might be repeat customers of ours um, that, you know, we spend a bit more activity on. Um, we do have some of that analysis, but not so much around the unregistered versus registered. By oh, just looking at your, your figures up there, um, the actuals for 2021-2022 are quite a lot different in terms of those percentage breakdowns. Is that because of the, the combination thing and the separation of that? But even, even 21, 42 and 58 seems, you know, quite out of sync in terms of what we wanted uh, that 2080, um, which... How does that actually eventuate? I wonder if I might answer that. It's essentially because we haven't been monitoring it. We haven't been using the policy as a guide to check that when we put in our budgets and when we determine what the rates needs to be, that we're going back to the revenue and financing policy, which is ultimately our guiding mechanism to determine what fees should be versus what rates should be. Um, so it doesn't change the budgeting process. It changes the what the computer spits out, rates should be versus fees. Hence why we know we've got a lot of work to do around the revenue and financing policy. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, Happy New Year. <laughs> uh, look, just some of my thoughts um, on this discussion. I, I'm much the same as um, Deputy Mayor Allen as well in regards to those points. I'm definitely about fair and equitable costs across the district in terms of dog and animal um, levies and costs. Um, and the reason I say that is I know that 
that sometimes different animals get rated at a different um, at a different level, and, and sometimes I find that quite difficult because the dog owner still has the same responsibilities. Doesn't matter what sort of dog or animal they own. Um, secondly, the five percent that we're seeing that don't um, follow the rules. I'm interested to know how we recover that time and cost and whether we do. Um, and if we aren't, then what's the mechanisms that we can use to help recover some of that cost? Um, because sadly, 95% of owners are affected by 5% of, of bad owners. Um, wording's really important for me. Um, you know, dog or animal, and the, reason, and the example I'll give is when does a dog become an animal? When does an animal become a dog? And, and I'll relate it to this. It's like farm yets on a farm. There comes a point in time when a farmer deems their bear or work gig because it's easier to keep it compliant on the farm than it is to keep it compliant on the road. And I just wonder whether we end up opening up a can of a similar nature if we don't use really good wording around dog and animal control. And, and um, yeah, I think you know what I'm saying in that regard. And I did share some feedback to Vi prior to Christmas around this because I, I said to her it would be great to have some guiding principles for our district around dog and animal ownership. So I don't know what those 10 commandments could look like, but it would certainly be great that this district had some guiding principles to assist our owners to understand this is the this is the way in which we want to see animals treated. Um, you know, this is the way we're going to um, reflect that in our council policy. Um, so that's my little bit of feedback. Kia ora. Councillor Jennings, go ahead if you're. Thanks, Sita. Yeah, look, I'm um, sorry. I was trying to look back at um, the, for the slide before Christmas that actually detailed the total uh, dollar amount for this activity, the joint activity, because I, I I was under the impression that one of the things that we really wanted to understand was what's the split in terms of how much of the activity is spent on dog control versus animal control. And the reason that I think that's important is because it's my understanding is it's the same people using the same vehicles, using the same equipment, using the same facilities. And so the fundamental reason that we have uh, that infrastructure in terms of people and vehicles and all that kind of stuff is because of the dog activity, because we we have a legal obligation to provide that activity. There's a legal obligation to have the registration. So... Um, Understanding actually how how the time and or how the operational cost is actually being allocated and utilised across those two activities, I think is is quite important. But uh, yeah, I'm certainly of the view, um, along with um, Deputy Bear uh, Allen, that uh, the 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 private benefit certainly for the dog activity uh, needs to be um, at least that 80 80 percent. Um, but you know, I, I was probably more in that 90 10 camp because. Um, I see this very much as an activity that, um, that yes, ultimately 95% of or, or, you know, a high percentage of, of dog, good dog owners end up cross-subsidising bad dog owners. But the reality is that that activity fundamentally still exists because they own a dog. And so the lead sort of framework is in place because of dog ownership. So um, for me, it, they, they should be the ones that carry the you know the majority of the of, of the cost of, of that activity just to highlight it just a quick look it's about a million dollars in total for that activity yeah and so, and so 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 the question question for me would be so are we saying that animal control component of that million bucks is is it two hundred thousand or is it you know Twenty thousand, like because uh, because it, it, for me, there's probably no point um, separating them out if if the number of if the number around animal control is just actually quite minuscule. Um, so we've worked it out based on seventy percent of the time, or well, seventy five percent of the time, spent on animal control, and the balance is spent on animal control. Sorry, did I say that right? 75 cents on dog control and the balance on animal control. Sorry, the other way around. And, and is, that, is, that, is that based on 
uh, incident like response data or, you know, like time. You know, we know that we allocate X amount of time uh, to staff doing registration stuff and then following up on registrations and stuff like that. Is that is that just a thumb suck or is that actually um, driven by some data? Um, can I say it's a bit of both? Um, so it is okay. around where, where we think the majority of our time is spent. Um, that said, we uh, do need to provide a stock control service or a stock control activity. You know, it is part of, of what we need to provide as well. So it's not just about the amount of time spent, it's also about the need to provide that service as well, both during and after hours. So is that is that because we're required to do it under the, on the Local Government Act or some other piece of legislation, is it? Correct. It's under the Impounding Act. Okay. Just further to that, if I can um, just respond to um, Councillor Tommy Hammond's question around the 5% and the avenue for us to um, collect um, the costs associated with that. So for us, um, that 5%, the avenue through the Dog Control Act is through the infringement process. And so we do issue infringements to all dogs that are unregistered. Is at the 31st of October. Actually, it says at the 30th of September, and we'll go through that process through until the 31st of October, um, the issuing of those infringements. So where to from here? I'm just now thinking about how we refine the discussion and what then comes to a meeting of council in terms of percentages, numbers, and what it looks like in dollar terms and that sort of thing. It would be helpful today if we could get a steer from the table in terms of a percentage that you're comfortable with. What we can then do is at the next meeting come back and have a conversation about what the what the impacts of that are on the fees and charges, for example, in those particular areas. Could, could I suggest a 10% public, 90% private? That's a starting point for discussion. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably support, um, I'm not too far away from Deputy Mayor Allen, but probably 2080. It's a prime. Can I just, can I just interfere um, and just say, it really, doesn't it really hinge on, because the separation of dog and animal control now means that, say, 250 grand of, uh, or almost 250 grand of the, uh, animal control activity, or the to the total activity, which then gets allocated to animal control, will be rates funded. So, in terms of the 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 changing the percentage around dog control, it doesn't actually it's not going to have a huge material impact because you're essentially you know you're you're changing things because you're you're making the animal control primarily rates funded. Just confirming, though, that's only 25% of the allocation of costs versus 75%, which is, is the dog control. So making that discussion and that change in the dog control is based on the, 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 the big proportion of the budget, effectively. But, yeah, so, so what I'm saying, though, is at the moment, so that the, the, the high end of the private benefit at the moment across the entire activity would be 800 grand um, private funded, two hundred grand rate funded, and then the low point would be, uh, you know, seven hundred grand private funded, and th three hundred thousand rates funded, uh, and so like in terms of changing the percentage of then a dog control activity sitting on its own at seventy to ninety, but uh, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars. With you know, like it's in it's in the margins. It's not it's not a significant shift here. Am, am, am I making am I making sense? We currently have five hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars worth of income in the in the activity. Just to highlight that from a from an income perspective, um, it's just to a rough. Yeah. So, Councillor Jennings, I think like you you are correct, and your point I think you've articulated well. Probably just the um, the comment I'd make is that you need to compare actual so current state versus our current policy position 
so the how you've just articulated it is based on if we were implementing our policy as our policy currently stands, we're not. And so rather than at the low point or at the high point, our current income being 700k to 800k through dog registration fees, it's not. It's the 570, 537, which is about 72%. So in terms of what we're currently at, if we assume 75% of the costs relate to dog control, um, it's approximately 71% that is funded through fees at this stage. Well, can I just ask a question? You've got down here the increase of 5%, what that would mean. Does that actually change the proposed new policy to 30 40% public benefit, or does that go... Yeah, I, what I'm trying to get, I suppose, does an annual increase of four dollars make? Does that satisfy what that thirty forty percent is? And if we changed it to ten or twenty percent, does that mean we've got to increase the f annual fee? Um, so I'm not sure about the um, if the five percent would meet the. Um the requirements of what we're proposing. Sorry, I didn't do that before now, but um, definitely the concept of we are changing the public-private split um, will impact on the amount of registration fees. It's probably, if you're going to 80, it's probably about, you'd say, around 10%. Um just responding to Sam's point, like I get it, but the fact that we're not, what well, I don't know if honour is the right word, but honouring the policy, it's not right anyway, so we can talk about dollars, actuals or not, and um, it comes back to the fact of, you know, private and public benefit and, you know, what's fair and who's benefiting the most and who should. So I'm very comfortable and increasing, not, I'm not satisfied with 30 to 40, it's it's 10 or it's 20% versus 80, 90 for me, um, regardless of, yeah, what you said. Sorry. Just just a final word from me, because I, I don't want to dominate this thing, but I, I think what we've heard around the table is a very ringing endorsement that there is a clear private benefit on this issue. and out of that discussion should fall a very clear message when it comes to setting the percentages, which is why I'm suggesting the 10, 90. So, that, so that's what's driving that, and it's really reinforcing what uh, Councillor Piri here has already said, that you know we, we've had the discussion, we've established the principles, let the ratios fall out of those principles. How about, and just as a suggestion, if next week we come back with options in terms of what fees look like, to both have a 20, an 80 20 or a 90 10, so that you can understand what the impact is on current fees. And if we were to move to a, an 80 20 and be compliant, or move to a 90 10 and be compliant, what those individual fees, uh, fee assumptions would look like, would that be helpful? But the, because the current is not right, it'd have to be current what it should be and what we're proposing it to be. So that's every three examples, not two. Um, we've got a little bit of a gap from six to sixty to seventy percent split that the officers have put to us. Is there any rationale that argues where, where we've got to sixty to seventy in terms of the the sort of recommended policy shift movement that we would need to factor into a discussion? Whereas elected members we suggesting maybe a 10 to 20 percent split would be more active it was more around um trying to keep some control over the the fees that were charged for the dog owner when we recognize that the entire animal control and dog control activity isn't necessarily about the dog owner um, or about dog responsibilities um that 
That said, it was also factoring in um, the fact that we haven't been compliant with the policy and trying to, you know, without the graces shift, align um, the activities to be compliant, if I'm honest. Um, I suppose a final little comment from me. Um, I'm just trying to understand the animal control component and what it is. Um, because while I hear dog control and I see the figures here, I'm actually trying to understand, so what's the role of animal control? What, what's the, you know, we're talking horses breaking out of paddocks, cows walking on roads, and then... You know, a dog owner has to pay. Where do the animal owners contribute? Just, you know, I'm just asking. Are we, are we, as part of the stuff we look at, you know, farmers have got obligations around TB tracking. Are, are we, are we part of that too? Or I'm just trying to understand what it is and what is animal control? Take dogs away. Um, so dog control activities aside, which is anything associated with dogs and dog ownership um, and control in the district. The animal control activity are things like um, exactly what you said, um, responding to stock call-outs, so this is wandering stock. Um, it is uh, anything from horses, which we do get, to um, you know, cows, sheep, um, all those types of wandering activities that we do have. And, and we are a rural district and we do get those quite frequently. Um, we um, also do, so an element of the patrolling when we are out and about, it's not just about dog control, it's not just about looking for you know, dogs that are out on the street, it's actually about looking at where there might be animals that aren't secure or um, where there is some sort of animal control um, type activity, such as um, recently we went and recovered a sheep that was tied to a clothesline, for example, that was as a result of some patrolling that we've been out there and actually seen um, from the roadside. So those sorts of activities are... Control. And do we? How do we recover our time from those exercises? That, that's really what I'm getting to. We're, we're taking a um, a budgeted activity. We're responding through because we have to. But how do those owners? How are they held responsible? So wherever possible, um, the fees again come back to um, what's set by legislation. So this is around the impounding act stuff. Oh, yeah. So where it is um, someone who might have, you know, I talked before about sometimes good dog owners have bad days, you know, their dogs get out the same thing for stock. Okay. Um, we have a compliance and enforcement model that we do here, it's called VAID, and we'll start at the bottom and it's about educating people. Not every single event that we go to, will we be able to recover the cost for, or do we think it's reasonable? Because it's about education and helping people to understand. So, and we do have um, areas in our district where there is a bit of time spent with owners around educating that it's not okay to tie this sheep up to the clothesline. <laughs> yes, you're keeping it contained on your property, but there's no shade and there's no feed and, and all of these sorts of things. Okay. We could move down to impounding it and infringing, but that's not always the best approach. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thanks everyone. So I think we'll now we'll move on to health licensing. Right, um, so health licensing is a little bit more challenging for us because, as I said before, for animal control and dog control, historically we've split those before. So we've known about um, the two separate activities and been able to do that split a little bit simpler um, based on that data. For the um, health licensing um, activity or environmental health activity, we haven't done that. We've got a whole range of functions that we deliver in the um, environmental health space, some of which are licensing activities and there are some fees and charges associated with delivering those licensing activities. Um, and the um, other components of that are um, almost in the, um, the the health and safety or the community safety aspects of these are things like um, responding to bylaw non-compliances, um, long grass complaints, abandoned vehicles, rodent complaints, um, those sorts of things where um, there isn't 
necessarily an avenue in the Health Act um, for us to recover those costs or where there is um, the avenue to recover or to set some fees and charges associated with it is not enough in which to recover the, the entire cost of delivering the service. So the um, proposal there, the current policy is 25 to 35% private benefit um, and what we are proposing Um, is that we move to a 15 to 25% um, private benefit. Um, as Jacinta said before, we thought we could go through a bit of a whiteboarding exercise to work out the, um, the public private or how much of it is, um, is a, of private benefit and the activities that are of private benefit and those that um, are of a public benefit. I guess it's up to um, councillors now to determine if that's the best way. All right, so um, I'll work through um, the functions and then maybe if we just decide as a table where um, they fit. So we'll start with licensing. We've got um, under the Food Act, food business registrations. So for that, the So this is for um, anyone in the district who are uh, selling food. Yeah. Who, who should pay for it? Or do you think that there is benefit to the wider public that they can go into a shop and buy food and know that they're not going to get sick? <laughs> It's a cost of doing business and it should be borne mostly by the business. At, at the national level, people that, well, businesses that put their products on the shelf in a supermarket have to go through some sort of permissions. And what does the government say about them? What's the public private split there? Just interested if anyone knows. It would sit on the business. It's a cost of business. Cool. All right. So we've got food business verification. So what this is, is the regular auditing of food businesses where um, council has an obligation under the Food Act to carry out that service. For this year, the Food Act is really clear and that we can recover 100% of the costs associated with verifications um, So from the food business that we're actually verifying. Yeah, I, I agree with Sam's comment. I think he's summed it up for me. I tend to also uh, go down that line as well. The cost of doing business is just a cost of doing business. We all have to do that if we're a business. And, yeah, I agree, yeah. It's, we're not talking massive amounts of um, money either, are we? Generally, it's only well. Okay, I mean, two hundred and fifty dollars or three hundred dollars is that what the yearly fee is, pretty much? Um, for a food business registration renewal, yes, two hundred and fifty dollars a year. Um, for the verification costs, they're usually up around about seven hundred and fifty dollars. It's. Is that all users who have applied in license, or is there a spot check process that goes with that? Um, so this is requ a requirement of the Food Act, and the, it has a schedule, I guess, um, and a bit of a matrix associated with when a food business gets verified. So we just need to do it based on that. It ranges from three monthly um, up to every 18 months, depending on the um, compliance of the food business. So do we differential between 
turnover in trade. So, like, if that's a thousand dollars or like for a business, does McDonald's pay a thousand dollars and um, the noodle canteen a thousand dollars regardless of turnover? Is Correct. It's not associated with turnover at all. Um, it's about the um, activity and the service provided by us. So if it takes four hours to do the and McDonald's is different there on a um, on a national sort of scope of arrangement. But if we did Noodle Canteen and maybe the next door down, what's that do those takeaways? Um, if we were to do a three hour verification here and a four hour verification there, they'd be charged appropriately based on the hours spent. Fine. In terms of new businesses starting, what's what's our rules around? Are they different in terms of the ongoing cost? I assume. Um, initially, yes. So initially, there's a bit um, more requirement on them and how soon and quickly they have their verification. So. The model of how frequently you have a verification is based on previous verification outcomes um, and then you can move up a step. Uh, and so when you're a new business, you're going to go through more frequent verifications before you can move on to a, a higher step. Probably worth at this point by just going back a slide and just reminding Council that our current policy says that it should be 25 to 35% private benefit. and this year, we're tracking at 1% private benefit funded. So so I just want to emphasise um, the realities of that, that we, are, we would be talking about increasing our price, our fees, to cover the 99% that currently our ratepayer is funding. And the guidance around the table is that that is the right thing to do. But it goes to show how when we don't monitor our policies, we get ourselves in a position of being so out of whack with our policy statements. Can I just add to that too? And in this um, portfolio, in this activity, there is actually the Food Act, which covers food businesses, and we spend a bit of time on that now. But there's also the Health Act, and there are some registrations and licensing components in the Health Act. Under the Food Act, it's really um, or heavily regulated around the fees that we can charge um, associated with the activity and time spent. Um, that goes through a public consultation process on its own to go and set those Food Act fees and charges. So we do need to consider that and, and factor in that when we do look to set those fees, it is going to have to go through a consultation process in accordance with the Food Act. The Health Act is different. Um, and those licences are things like hairdressers, funeral directors, camping grounds and offensive trades. Um, those ones there don't have to go through the same rigorous process that the Food Act fees and charges setting needs to go through um, and can be you know, dealt with as part of the annual plan process. Vi, do, the, do um, shops that sell vaping come into the offensive? No. So then on the um, sort of public safety side of things, there's the bylaw compliance um, and health act complaints. And health act complaints is really broad and can cover a whole lot of different complaints that we might receive. I mentioned before things like long grass complaints, rodent complaints, abandoned vehicles, general bylaw compliance. That's about the, someone complains about something going on next door, nine times out of 10, if it doesn't fit within the you know, pretty clear stream, like it's building or it's our remain or, um, or a food, it is gonna to fall to the EHOs, um, which is the Health Act. So I guess looking at the board, this is all of the, um, or most of the activities that we do in this um, environmental health space. As I said before, not all of it is about food and about licences. There's a huge amount there around um, you know, responding to complaints. Um, does the liquor licensing sit separately?
So in terms of bylaw compliance and Health Act complaints, um, there's in terms of beneficiaries, I'm sure that those that are complaining and, and the others that benefit from that complaint being resolved um, would be beneficiaries of, of that area. Um, what are the table's views in terms of who benefits from from that area of business? Am I right in assuming, though, that um, bylaw compliance um, is for the public good completely? I mean, I'm talking um, things like silly things like you're not allowed dogs uptown and stuff like that. That's an overarching sort of bylaw that we have. Um, they're not targeted as such. Um, and we never. It's really sending a message rather than um, enforcing any compliance as such because I don't think I've ever heard of anyone given an infringement of having a dog up down, uh, yet they're not supposed to be. But, you know, those sorts of things that are generally for the public good rather than for um, any private um, benefit. Jacinta and Vi. Sorry, go ahead, Councillor Jennings. Oh yeah. Um. So, 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 the thing that's probably um troubling me at the moment is that this is obviously a very diverse bucket, right? In terms of an activity, and there are parts of it where there is a clear exacerbator, and you know, a a, a, a person that you can clearly identify is um causing the need for the service and the resource like so for example the 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 food business licensing and so that's obviously can be pulled out of this total activity but there's more of a more of a miscellaneous bucket where there is no um there is no clear purpose uh, a person that you can essentially attribute the the cost to and so surely there's you know, I, I'm sort of leaning towards <laughs> proposal one at the moment because it feels like there needs to be some more um, analysis and um, breakdown of what actually makes up this bucket and whether there are some smarter ways of doing it. And so I, I don't know whether there's almost a hybrid of proposal one where um, we could do proposal one for everything except the food licensing stuff because that seems to me to be uh, you know, an easy one to sort of carve off, have separate. We obviously know the cost of it. We can um, understand the impact of changing the percentages uh, in terms of the fees and charges because, um, you know, if, if a business is facing, say, $1,000 worth of um, cost at the moment and then all of a sudden uh, to, to, to ensure compliance with a, with a new number in the revenue and finance policy and it's 10 grand, then obviously that's going to have a massive impact on our businesses. And so, uh, it, it, for me, the answer would be something that's more progressive, um, and, and that you that, that you'd need take t take time to, to 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 move in that direction. So, is that possible to sort of, I guess, split this split this health licensing bucket into into different slices? Yes, good question. So, what we're hoping to do is for next week um, is to present. Vi um, going to have a go at splitting up the activity costs into the different areas that can be apportioned a bit more reasonably to the sort of the buckets that are more public benefit and those that are more private benefit. So we'll attempt to do that for next week and hopefully we can reach a point where we'll be ready to have something that um, can be decided on for the, for the consultation. Thank you. So just to recap in this area, for those things that are licensing where they can be Directly attributable to uh, directly attributable to the business, then they should pay. Um, for those more public good elements, then it's reasonable that those come through rates. So that if that's what the general consensus is around the table, we'll go ahead and prepare the analysis for next week based on that. Thank you. Can I just sorry, just just one last question from me. Um, one of the things that Vi talked about was like the that in that miscellaneous buckets there were things like. Uh, abandoned vehicles and um, overgrown grass. How come these activities aren't being allocated to other things like, for example, abandoned vehicles would almost be like solid waste 
um, and um, uh, you know, long rafts would be um, in the in the recreational services or the you know that that sort of that space. How come how come there are things that are sort of falling into this general bucket where there is a more specific activity where they'd be more closely aligned to? I, I can probably comment on that, Council Janine's. Um, this is a pretty typical compliance activity. Um, the broader health licensing and compliance activity, typically you'll see in councils that it's either bundled together or it's separated. So you might have um, health licensing and then separate to that you have a compliance function. Um, so that is potentially an option we could bring back to you. Um, but it would be very unusual for some of those matters like the examples you just gave for that to sit within say for example solid waste or parks or property the thing you want to distinguish here is the assets that council own and maintain versus the private assets or that people own and the decisions they make with that asset or that business or that um, that function and so that's what the compliance activity exists to do is to ensure that that is compliant within council's bylaws. Thank, thanks for that, Malik. Because yeah, I guess that was just a question, like because it was just coming up in the context of like, say, fly tipping. Because I was always led to believe that like the cost of dealing with fly tipping was something that was covered by, by solid waste. But is that not the case? It's covered by this. So the cost, and this is where it gets um, confusing and a little bit unhelpful. So let's say we went and picked up a whole lot of rubbish on the side of the road for fly tipping, the cost to pick up that rubbish and put that rubbish wherever it needs to go, that will fall on the solid waste activity. But the um, let's say there was an investigation because we were able to find some letters in that rubbish and we could figure out who it was, that investigation sits in compliance. Understand. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Sorry to get into the weeds. Thanks. Okay, thanks everyone. So that was, um, was, I think it's been important to step into the policy in a bit more detail so you get, and then um, what, we, what we'll what we do as part of our ongoing reporting is bring that to more visibility so you can see on an ongoing basis where we are in terms of meeting our targets that are set. So in terms of like seeing the graphs that we showed you earlier a bit more often so that you can see how we're tracking. So before VIA takes off, is there anything else um, that you wanted to raise in, in terms of the revenue financing policy in that area. Thanks, Beth. Yeah. Okay, so the last part of the day, um, before we get on the bus, is to talk through where we're at in terms of the rates review. So we looked at, when we talked about before Christmas, looking at some more ways to make the rates more equitable. Um, and some of the conversations around that were potentially reducing the level of fixed charges, um, looking at different remission options. Um, and as we've just talked about today, making sure that significant exacerbators pay their share. So making sure that where people do benefit um, from an activity that they are the ones that need to pay for that activity. So that's part of making sure um, that rates are more equitable. This will be a very quick stop in terms of just highlighting again how we currently rate. Um, so in terms of our general rate, um, that's paid for through land value with our rural area, um, rural farming area, paying a lower differential in terms of that land value. Solid waste um, is a fixed targeted rate charge. Capital value we pay for through capital, uh, sorry, stormwater we pay for through capital value. Our library rate, as well as our rep and governance, our aquatics and our aquatic rate are all fixed charges. So we do have a number of fixed charges. Our roading rate is currently paid th for through capital value. And then in our waters areas, we have a fixed charge as well as um, for those properties that are charged through meter, um, a charge for those units that are above a certain level. As we've talked about and as Quotable Value have highlighted through their work um, is that in terms of the valuation this time around, there have been some significant changes in terms of both capital value change and land value change. 
Um, so that orange bar is a view of what the land value changes and the blue in terms of capital value. So our industrial area saw a massive change um, in terms of the capital value and land value, particularly land value. Um, but you can see as well in terms of our more rural area um, and industries, those increases were not as significant as they were in the residential sector. Also, in terms of different areas of the district and the relative land value and capital value changes, areas like Shannon, Tokomaru, and Foxton, Foxton Beach, saw some very significant increases in terms of their land value, but not as much of a change in terms of capital value. So when you talk about, when we talk about different options for changing the way that rates are structured, um, making decisions between basing rates on land value or on capital value can have some big impacts in terms of where you see changes happening. So different options that we've talked about are looking at the general rate and potentially shifting from rather than having it based on land value, shifting it to capital value, as well as looking at different options in terms of some of those targeted rates. Um, those properties, those rates that are charged where each property pays the same, if they have one, one property, um, then they pay the same rate regardless of the property's value. So those are things like our library, our com library and community center, um, so there were different options that we're considering in this space in terms of potentially moving the library and community centre rate, moving the library and community centre and aquatic rate to capital value, um, and potentially going as far as moving three of our fixed charges to capital value. Another option that seemed reasonable at the end of last year um, that we've done some more work on is around, yes, it makes it makes sense to discuss the option of moving our general rate to capital value, but also potentially moving some of our representation and moving our representation and governance costs into the general rate and also basing that on capital value as well, rather than having it um, as a fixed charge per property. When you look at capital value and moving to that rather than fixed charges, that's effectively from a from a from your perspective is recognize or potentially recognizing that it is deemed as equitable that you should pay your rates should be based on the share of capital value that you own rather than paying the same regardless of the value of the property that you own from a rates in the, in the area of rates for local government we cannot. We don't have the option to base anything on income because we don't have access to that income. So, effectively, capital value or land value can uh, or capital value effectively, in, in a number of circles, is, is is seen as the best proxy that a council has to determine wealth. And so, if if you think that it's reasonable to apportion rates on that basis, then then capital value is a good option for that. Now, this is one of the slides that's got a lot of information, and you'll get even more information at an SA1 very detailed level next week. But in terms of the 2023 rates, we currently they currently sit at $52.8 million. And at this currently today, the rural sector pays $13.1 million of that, and residential $39.7 if we assume that the valuations go through as they, as they were, are required to, but we make no change other than that, then effectively $106,000 less would be paid by the rural sector um, and $106,000 more by the residential sector. That's effectively because of the of the change in terms of the average capital value and land value change means that um, residential sector has increased by more in value than has the rural sector. Now we start to look at some of the different options um, that and what they have in term and what they mean in terms of the shift between rural and residential. 
option one and option five are some areas where we've done quite a bit more modeling on because they, while they have an impact of, of they offset the impact that there is in terms of valuation between um, residential and rural, but they don't have a, a, a large impact in terms of they're not changing the shift between 600,000 and a million dollars between the two areas but they're changing it by less than 200,000. So in terms of the options that we've moved forward with in terms of more analysis is the option to shift from general rate, the, the general rate moving to capital value and also the general rate moving to capital value, um, but shifting also the rep and governance into that space as well. The other options, while we could go into heaps of detail with them, there are, they are a pretty significant change um, and absolutely could be considered, but I'll show you the other ones in a little bit more detail and then you can decide if, if for the next workshop you want to see some of the other ones as well. I'm not going to go through this bit in more detail detail today. Um, I'll step through the graphs in a little bit more detail, but what this does do is part of the long-term plan, we regularly include example properties in the consultation document. So based on the conversation, what we've done for you is we've, this is the rates that we set as part of this annual plan, but we've also given you an indication of what they would have, for these properties, what would it have looked like based on the valuation what would it have looked like based on option one and option five and including the rates increase for this year, the 7.9. So I'll go through that in more detail next week, but I wanted to give you a chance to digest it um, because it's a, it's a lot of information to take on at this stage. Let me know if it doesn't, but I find this view does help a little bit in terms of just seeing things a little bit more simply. So what this view gives you is an idea of the number of properties and how many properties are going to be impacted by how much when you look at different options that are proposed. So I'll, I'll step through it and, and then you can ask questions as we go. So based on the new valuation, There were 7,000 properties, almost 7,000 properties, which would have seen a decrease of between zero and 5% based on nothing else changing other than the valuation. There would have been almost 5,000 properties that would have seen an increase of between zero and 5% in their rates based on that valuation change only. And when we look at, when we think about the, the areas of the district, because we base our general rate on land value, those areas that changed significantly were Shannon, Tokumaru, Foxton Beach, and Foxton. So probably those areas of the district that could bear those rates increases less than could other areas of the district. Those are probably those areas of, dis, of the district that we've seen in terms of the average rates or the average median household income have got some of the lowest um, in our district. And I'll show you um, that in a little bit more um, in a minute. So if we say we know what happens in terms of the valuation increase in those blue lines, let's have a look and see what would happen if we shifted our general rate to capital value and also took into account that there was the valuation change. So we didn't change the rates at all for next year. We didn't think about the 7.9% rates increase, but we did shift um, our general rate to capital value rather than land value. So you can see what that does is there's almost 5,000, close to 6,000 properties in the residential area that would see a, a decrease um, of between zero and five percent, but it does kind of you see the number of properties that were going up from zero to five. It does kind of bring the impacts down a little bit. 
So it isn't quite as significant as a change as you would see just because of that revaluation change. In terms of the areas of impact as well, yes, there are some that are increasing by more than 10 to 15. And what we'll do next week is we will, for anyone that's increasing by more than 15 or 17 percent, we'll make sure that you have an understanding of why, because the questions will come um, depending on the options that we take. So it's really, really important that you understand all of the drivers of these outliers in terms of, of the significant changes. So if you were to Center. move... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Uh, is there also any way to tell in that um, numbers that you bring back whether there are ratepayers that are multiple property owners and so like they might be facing, say, 10%, but over five properties? <laughs> um and so, like, is there any way to tell us, like, that where there is, like, um, so, so in those people that are affected over the, in those bigger numbers, whether there's multiple properties owned by the same person affected? We can have a good go at that in terms of, I mean, you can have a go in terms of if it's the same company ownership. It might be a bit tricky to tell if they are, yeah, if they are have multiple companies and you couldn't tell the linkages between them. Um, but yeah, we, yeah. we would have, I mean, we might, we might not say specifically who they are in the analysis, but we could give you an indication of that if we can find it. Yep. Councillor yeah. Councillor Gina. I guess just some ex- do, Yep. Could you give us a bit of a sense about why that would be helpful, just so we can understand the context, because that might help yeah. us do the analysis? Yeah. So I guess, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, over, say, one property, um, for, like, over one farming property, it could be an increase of you know, several thousand dollars. But if it's, uh, if there's a holding of a number of farming properties, for example, you know, a person, a, a single rate payer could be looking at 10, 20 grand total in, in rate increase. Like, so I'm just trying to get a sense of like, um, but because we always look at it on an individual property basis, but the, the people that I'm expecting the most impact to have on, in terms of that, a uh, shift to um, capital value, and is in rural, but particularly the, where there's multiple uh, mo- multiple properties owned. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's just such a small part, but I, I yeah, that, that's what I'm um, that's what I'm just nervous about is that that it, that yes, it might not look like you know a huge increase across one property, but across multiple properties, it's actually a, a, a massive chunk. Um, that that um, could actually have a really significant uh, impact on on one you know one or one or more rate payers. I think I hear what you're saying. Um, I'll have a look at it as we're as we're going um, in terms of because we, we are looking at the top fifty rate payers, for example, to get an understanding of those those ones that pay the most in terms of rates. What are the impacts for them? Just so that we can understand as well. Yeah, if, just I think that's fine. Yeah, I think it might come out through that. So that's fine. No worries. Thanks. Okay, so just to give you an idea, so farming, this is rural property. So when the OTP was set last time, a decision was made that you might be rural. So, for example, um, properties that are own and operate businesses in the rural area, but they are not farming-related businesses in terms of having large holdings, for example, aren't captured within the current differential. So in terms of the impact that I've, I've shown here is those properties that are currently receiving a differential um, for land value so that it's clear the impact on this particular area because I think this is one that um, has a has a, had potential to change significantly. So with that, you can see in terms of the valuation, there was potential for almost 9,000 properties to decrease by more than, but decrease between zero and ne- and, and negative and less than five and five percent. Um, the options in terms of the conversation around, if you look at the orange and the light orange, option five actually seems to reduce those impacts, so that the in- most of the increases are um, there's some decreases, but also um, some, the increases seem to largely be held within this area. There's a few in the 5 to 10, 
um, that, well, not a few, there's actually there's a, um, just over a thousand in the five to 10, which we need to make sure we understand why and what, does that make sense? Um, but in terms of the impacts that we're looking at in that area, um, just to give you a sense, that's what that's currently looking like. So the huge majority, um, if you went with option one or option five, um, would sit in between the zero and zero to five and zero to minus five. Um, but there are some outliers in the five to 10 and the minus five to minus 10 area, which you need to get some more understanding on. What Does will that include the 7.9? Ah, thanks. Good question. So, in terms of this gray bar here, because option five um, seemed like a reasonable option that option 5 um, 2024 assumes the 7.9 as well so um, if you went with option 5 assuming this year um, is sitting here but then if you also then add in the, the 7.9 percent rates increase that's what it would look like um, for those properties as well Jacinta where does the issue of the differentials sit in this discussion? So at this stage, in terms of the differential, I've kept the analysis quite clean in the sense that generally a differential will largely sit on land value-based rates because capital value effectively builds in the fact that residential properties have a house and a significant portion of the value of that property sits on there and is valued as the rates form part of the house and any other um, property on that forms part of the value that people are rated on. So there isn't as much of a justification for the rural sector receiving a differential on their capital value as there is for them receiving it on their land value because for, for residential properties and other business, the actual capital value um, the buildings and the other ancillary items on on that land actually form a bigger proportion of the value than they do would do for a rural property. There will be there will be exceptions, um, and when you look at these ones, we need to be careful of those and clearly understand what's happening with them and why that's causing such a change. But absolutely, a conversation could be had about a, a certain level of differential for those which may bring some of that back. Yeah. Utilities. So utilities includes us as well, but in terms of three waters, for example, and, and those types of utilities, once we transition to a new entity, um, those utilities would need to be paid for by the new entity. So as part of, often with utilities, there is a, there is no land value, but there is a capital value component. So they often don't um, receive a lot lower rates under a, a fixed charge or a land value base. Um, so in terms of this analysis, you'll see that in the utility area, I'm sorry, I'm just looking for my data here. Um, there's a massive change in terms of, while there aren't a lot of properties, Based on this change, currently utilities pay $144,000 in terms of rates. Um, with the valuation change that was planned to go to $161,000. Option 5, which is moving cap to capital value with rep and governance as well, would see that shifting to $744,000. So effectively, um, it's close to $600,000 more. Um, to be paid by the utilities rather than... Um, but when you think about a conversation about contribution of value being a contributor to a rates conversation, this is utilities as one of those ones that changes significantly. Topo, when they did their rates review and moved to capital value, had some, some significant challenge in this area, but they, they were successful in their rates. Um, so this is one that I thought was important that we talk about separately. And so when we look at some of the impacts for rural, for example, not being as high as maybe I would have thought originally, and for some of the residential, that's because 
of the contribution that's increased from the utility area. This, these next, I'll, I'll flick to this one first, but one thing that I thought would be just interesting for the table to have a look at today is we have the information on SA1 areas, so that's a census area unit, um, the smallest census area unit that we can gather information on um, and still receive median household income. So what I did was selected all SA1 areas with median household income of less than $50,000. So not everybody in that, in that area unit by any means has income that low, but the middle point for that area is $50, 000, 50, less than $50,000. So there, that means that there are a significant number of households within that area um, that, have rate, that have household incomes of less than that. So this was to look at for those areas, if we were to look at modeling and moving to option five, for example, or option one, how, what would that look like um, for those areas? And just because of the conversation around affordability being a big factor in this conversation, um, there are almost um, 2,500 properties in those SA1 areas, and they would see, or sorry, there's more than that, but almost 20, 20 750 maybe would see um, under option one would would see a, a decrease in their rates of between zero and five percent even um, in terms of the increase based on 2024 we'll bring that back next week but it just I thought it was important to highlight that even under option five for example there would be just over it was probably 1700 properties that would see a decrease of between 5 and 10% in their rates based on the same rates today. So that does mean that moving to capital value, if your objective is to reduce rates for those that are on lower incomes or and by proxy have a lower value property, then this does achieve that in terms of, of going some way towards alleviating rates for those properties. That does mean that someone needs to pay the other the other direction, um, but it's about understanding the impacts on those other ones and and and, and understanding whether um, that that's deemed to be fair and reasonable. Another view um, that I prepared was just a view of what does that mean for Shannon, Tokomaru, Foxton, and Foxton Beach. Um, because those can often be talked about in terms of areas that have challenge in terms of rates as well. So um, like the other graph, that does give some significant relief for a number of families um, in those areas as well in terms of the rates. So Thinking about next week, the intention would be, I just wanted to test the table in terms of your thinking, is to give you a view of one of these graphs with both percentages and dollars, so two graphs effectively, for each SA1 area um, in the district so that you can see what the impacts are um, with evaluations, with option one, option five, and also with the 2024 rates in it. So you can go through each SA1 area, understand the impacts. Also, what we'll look to do is where there are significant increases or decreases of more than 15 to 17%, we will provide explanations as to why that's happening and make sure that you're comfortable with... with um, we just didn't want to bring it today because the analysis wasn't quite finished to the level that it needed to be to present it today. Um, so by the end of the session next week, you'll understand what's happening at each of the individual areas of the district and how many people and by how much. Understand what's happening with rural, with business, with utilities. I'll make sure we continue that view as well in terms of summarizing some of the areas where there might be more hardship than others. Um, and then also provide that explanation of um, the outliers and why. 
so that you should be um, primed in, in terms of understanding the impacts of, of the different areas of the district and make sure that you're comfortable putting a recommendation forward um, in terms of going out to consultation. Is there anything in terms of the level of information that you think you might want to have that we can add in and include? Just quickly, just to, um, I think it'd be quite good just to have a few examples, um, you know, just randomly, just for each, so then I can just, yeah, analyse it a little bit. Maybe, for example, in your area, having different types of farms, because we do have categories for the, from QV in terms of the different farming and, and size of maybe various size. Would that be helpful? Yeah, I think so. And then also, I guess, you your Foxton Beach, you know, Shannon and that, just to see sort of, I suppose, what impact there is an example. Yeah. Um, kia ora, Jacinta. Thank you for that. Um, support what Paul said, actually. Um, just a couple of thoughts from me as just to help me process it. I was trying to understand, um, well, when the cost analysis, you know, over maintaining rural and residential responsibilities for council. So we don't actually understand what, um, what it is we're required to maintain in those areas and how much council have to contribute to continue to maintain whatever it is we have to maintain in those areas. Because why I say that is, as developments unfold, um, and there's many going around in the rural sectors right now, I'm guessing that those development and lands now come off the rural charge and go across to the residential. But how do we see that reflected? Like how fast does that adjustment happen for you guys in terms of capturing that change of the landscape, the use of the landscape? But also, do we ever analyse... Um, the impact of that development going on. So while the house is there now, we've lost a bit of a rural sector, so that's less rural to maintain. Now we've got more residential to maintain. What's the actual ongoing cost for us to maintain that stuff and the impact on the rural sector? Now, I know physically we see an impact in terms of loss of farming land and, and, and that type of stuff, but I'm just trying to understand how do you see it? How do you capture it? What, how do you ch turn it around? Um, and make that now readable. I'm sorry, it's probably really hard to answer. And, and I'm even sitting here thinking about, you know, when we rate land, I, I'm hearing, you know, homes as an example, residential, I'm hearing that, you know, one fee for each property. Um, but me, I own my house with my wife, and I've got one house on it. How's that transferred to a property that's got a set of seven flats on it? Is, is, are they paying the same rate too, or is there an adjusted rate? Because, well, and the reason I say this is because I've now got seven dwellings on one property that require a whole lot more, and they are putting back into our systems more. So how do you um, reflectively cover that? Because if we're going to talk equitable, then that's exactly what I mean. It shouldn't be one for one property. It's I, I, in my mind's mind. I'm thinking it's the use on that property and and the output from that property that we as a council are, are obligated to to maintain with whatever's coming off that property: stormwater, wastewater, uh, all those types of things. Keeping the access to that property, the ceiling of the property. You know, I'm just that's just me. Sorry, I've written notes here and gone bit. <laughs> No, it's a good question. So we do, I mean, from the point that when someone plans to subdivide, for example, or put an extra dwelling on the property, that's captured at the start in terms of the development contributions that people pay um, when they're developing the charge for eroding, for water, for wastewater, for stormwater, and because they're effectively paying for the impact that that property is going to have on the capital investment that we need to make going forward. So they're paying at that stage. Then in terms of rates, once, for example, they trigger an inspection and a need for a water connection as part of that development, then the rates team will receive that information. Then from the following year, they will be charged for those individual, if five houses are going on, then they'll be charged for five more units of demand from a water, um, wastewater, um, the individual library, community centre rates, all of those, they will pay five, five portions of that. And then in terms of the 
the capital value in terms of the general rate um, or, or the stormwater rate, they will pay the increased value based on the extra buildings that are on the property as well and any extra land value that's been created by the fact that they've subdivided. Or if they even just put extra properties on, like for example, Spelthurst isn't separate titles, but each year we receive a report that says how many more dwellings are on the property so that it can be charged. Yeah. Or, or you might have a house and you decide that you're going to build an additional ensuite. And so that additional ensuite, um, because there's another toilet and shower in there, is likely to mean that when it goes through building consent stage, our rates team then capture that and they then get another pan charge for a water or wastewater, an additional water or wastewater rate. It's um, it's certainly not perfect, but it is a lot more probably advanced than you probably think. Where we have um, challenges, probably to the earlier part of your question, and you'll see some of this in the council agenda that gets released this afternoon in the organisation performance report of where growth starts to kind of catch up on us is take all the subdivisions and the urban um, the urban spray regime. You think about all those additional streets that have been created. Those additional streets didn't exist when we contracted recreational services five years ago to deliver that. And so what it costs now versus what it cost five years ago because there is actually, there are more streets to spray. Um, we've got a bit of work to do around our mapping um, and in particular things like solid waste, storm water, like what's urban versus rural. But we're not going to be there for this long-term plan amendment. I think that's why I raised the question around, you know, even the development contribution, it's only there at the start, but what's the ongoing commitment to maintaining that development because it's a one-off? Yeah, so they pay rates. Okay, so that reaches the end of the workshop, so thanks everybody. Um, in terms of what it looks like between now and when consultation starts, uh, next week we will have a further discussion around the rates review like we talked about where we will um, provide that extra and go through that extra detail, um, provide an update on the consultation document um, progress um, so that in an understanding of your involvement during the consultation period. Um, and the following week uh, we'll discuss the consultation document and supporting material um, so that is the full supporting material that will effectively become the long-term plan. So you've received one component of that today, which is the CAPEX report, um, detailed report on what we're planning to spend. Um, and at that stage, then we'll be getting into the, into the audit. So from the 13th of February to the 3rd of March, we'll be going through the audit process with Audit New Zealand. Um, and then on the 15th of March, um, is when you will adopt the consultation document and supporting material so that we can go out for consultation from the 27th of March to the 1st of May. So it's all happening. <laughs> um, and there'll be, hopefully, um, it'll, it's been a great process in terms of the conversations that we've had with you um, prior to Christmas. And I think that will put us in a really good position um, to work hopefully smoothly through this next phase. Um, the conversations about the revenue and financing policy, so we've got a little bit more to have around that next week as well, um, to agree on the funding splits and the relative fees for that process. Um, but we're tracking along well in terms of working through the, what we need to do to get to the audit stage. Um, and probably also just to remind you that at next week's workshop, we'll obviously be taking you through the draft business case around the future of Live in Landfill um, in order for you to see the the option, you know, the detail around those options that you've given guidance on us, guidance to so far, um, with the view that at the 8th of February workshop, you're giving us a clear steer on what we're consulting on and what other options, what the preferred option is that we want to capture as part of our financial model that audit will do its work on. Great, any questions from anyone before we wrap up? Jacinta, just, just one from me. Jacinta? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hey, just a quick question in terms of, um, and, I've, and I've talked to you about it before, but the, the whole concept of um, rates postponement for 
uh, over 65s and and potentially you know even a slightly more wider scope. That's obviously relevant to the the rates affordability discussion. And so I just wondered what would be involved in potentially asking a sort of an open question as part of the consultation process around the rates review around appetite or interest in in council adopting a, a, a rates postponement policy or fra- fra- framework, I guess. Um, is there a huge amount of work involved in um, sitting, you know, needing to be done in order to ask sort of an open question like that in the consultation um, document, or, or can we open, can we ask that question um, essentially as a, as a tool to gather, I guess, yeah, a sense of where the community might be sitting on that particular issue. Oh, oopsie. sorry. Go you. I'll go after you. Um, about that, it, for me, um, something I'd rather do in an LTP proper rather than the amendment. And uh, I mean, my initial thoughts are, because because I'm open to looking at, at you know, what that what that might look like, but with a um, roughly twenty five percent population of over 65s in the whole whenua and it's hard to anticipate how many of those would want to um, apply for such a postponement but, but if a lot did and it meant because we're not gathering you know collecting like their rates we're having to borrow in the absence until such a time um, but then there's not a lot of headroom now that we're looking at the um, jamming all this first three years of, you know, do you see what I'm saying? So I don't know that we can actually afford to to do it unless you've, I mean, you probably need to do some, go away and do something. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a little bit, um, we could get caught and I'd rather have more certainty around we've got three waters or not and then at the LTP proper yeah we can do that um we can actually it's it's more realistic actually I wouldn't like to do it now and then yeah we no right yeah look I just want to say I'm totally opposed to it at this stage uh Councillor Dick was given reasons which I endorse but in addition to that I could see it becoming a total distraction from the real focuses foci that we want to concentrate on on this amendment process and and the second and final reason is we've had a really interesting discussion about fairness and equity trying to look at how we can make things better and to say that potentially we're going to discuss the concept whereby 25 percent of the population regardless of income and ability to pay and so on should get a break to me would be something that i'd just not be interested certainly not at this stage I know it was considered by this council a number of years ago and was decided not to put it forward. Happy with either view. Um, I know my, my previous role at Capity, we had a policy. No one um, applied, had ever applied for it. So it's it's a difficult um, it's difficult to predict who might apply. Um, but happy to take the steer from the table on what your preference is. Yeah. Well, look, as the person that raised it, um, I'm not. I mean, I don't agree with how um, uh, Count, uh, Deputy Mayor Allen represented a couple of things there because it's certainly not giving people a break. They ultimately pay the cost of it, um, including the, the the interest cost and obviously the cost of administering that scheme. So, um, but look, I, I'm happy to, um, uh, you know, I guess take take um, Councillor Tukapua's um, thinking on board and then that perhaps it's it's better to deal with it through an LTP proper. I guess what I was looking for was more more of something sort of as a pre-step to that. It, it, it's sort of along the lines of, do you even want us to look at this? Because it is an option as part of, it's it's relevant to the discussion around the rates affordability. Because at the moment, we're trying to solve uh, a, 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 an issue of um, 
of making sure that rates are affordable. Well, one way that rates can be affordable and managed by households is if they're given the option, people on fixed incomes, particularly in that over 65 bracket, one of the options to help them in this in the uh, in the rates affordability um, space is to give them the opportunity to postpone that so that uh, those rates are then collected at a later point in time uh, at the time that the property is sold. So um, to kind of suggest that it's not relevant is, is yeah, it doesn't fly with me. I wonder whether um, I could offer a suggestion, and I offered this to the community board last night, who, because um, obviously as part of the long-term plan, we've got to talk to the Fox and Beach community about those two previous decisions about funding from the freeholding account um, uh, for projects in Foxton. And in addition to that, last night the community board were quite keen to um, convince council that in our consultation we should consult on a splash pad in Foxton and Foxton Beach. And my advice to the community board was, let's just remind ourselves that this is a really big LTP amendment and we're going to be talking to the community about lots of things. And it's not a formal consultation process that we have to talk about everything. And so picking up on your idea, Sam, a suggestion is let's get through the long-term plan amendment and let's just remind ourselves that we can do engagement at any time. It doesn't need to be formal consultation. And we can do polls, we can sound through our citizen panels, which we're going to establish, some of those ideas leading up to the long-term plan proper. So let's put, you know, recognising there'll be different views around the table, but let's put that idea into the parking lot and let's capture it during an engagement process after the long-term plan amendment, but before we do long-term plan proper. Is that? Fair enough. Yep, great. Great solution. Okay, thanks. Alongside that in a splash pad at Foxton. Thanks, Jacinda. There's a huge amount in there, and um, I'm sure that next week will be even more and um, formative. Uh, but thanks for all that, Jess. Yeah, so we'll plan? just have a five minute break, and yep. that's the completion of public workshop. But we'll just go into councillor only time where you've got a conversation to have about your council plan on a page, and then the bus arrives at three.
Okay, everyone. Um, so in front of you, you will see a one-page um, document. Well, everyone. Got one of those? Okay. So this is uh, the retreat on one page. All right. So from that, um, it has spent some time putting together all those uh, priorities and ensuring that um, we have a one-page document that can sit in front of us and even um, um, bears our, if you like, our placement uh, for um, our governance organisation chart, if you like, in terms of what, we're, what we've got ahead of us. It is deliberately set out like this, but obviously that is why it's being put in front of you now, so that you can have some discussions around whether you believe that that is the right way to set it out. But also, um, this will be part of the agenda next for next Wednesday, where we will 